Hello everyone, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thank you very much for watching this video here on Guide to Legal History and Historians, where we will be covering all of the chapters and authors of the Han Oxford Handbook of Legal History, edited by Marcus D. Dubber and Christopher Tomlins. This happens to be episode 22, however, they do not need to be watched in order, as per the editors, these chapters are not in chronological order, but rather a, uh, an amalgamation of many different topics. So this chapter, these two chapters will be in part four, Traditions Tracing Legal History, and the two titles are, chap are titled Indigenous Rights, Latin America by Thomas Duve, and Indian Law by Mitra Sh Sharapi. So if you happen to be interested in indigenous rights in Latin America or Indian law, this is your place. Or if you just want to get a bigger picture of the larger legal history space, I encourage you to continue watching this. So nonetheless, also in the style of Plutarch's Lives, which I have a previous series on all the parallel lives of Plutarch, there will be a comparison between the two authors. And also in addition to the two chapters, I've also added brief biographies of both of the two authors, authors, those being Thomas Duve and Mitra Sharafi. So without further ado, we will begin with Indigenous Rights Latin America by Thomas Duve and his respective biography, and after that we will continue on to in Indian Law by Mitra Sharafi and have a comparison of both the two authors as well. So a little biography about Thomas Duve. He is a German jurist and historian born on April 26, 1967. He's a law professor at the Goethe University in Frankfurt and director of the Max Planck Institute for Legal History and Legal Theory of the Max Planck Society since 2009. He has studied law and philosophy at Heidelberg University, Pontifical University, Catholic University of Argentina, the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, and the Munich School of Philosophy. He passed the Stats exam in Deutschland in 1994, that is Germany, for, which is his government licensing for to be in law, he, and he received his Venii Legend for Civil Law, German Legal History, Historical and Comparative Law, Philosophy of Law, and Canon Law, his highest, which is the highest university degree, that is the Venii Legend. And he received his doctoral vater, was or his doctoral vater, which would be his doctoral supervisor, was the famed legal historian and canonist Peter Landau. Among others, he is a member of the advisory board of Lus Luris Canonici Medi AV Consociato, or ICNAC, and of the Stephen Cutter Institute of Medieval Canon Law. He's also an academic member of the Academia Europea, and the, as well the Max Planck Society, the Academy der Wissenschaften und der Literatur, the National Academy of History of Argentina, the Instituto de Investigaciones de Historia del Derecho, and the Institute of International de, uh, Inter, Institutio Internacional de Historia del Derecho Indiano. So many, many, and there's others as well that he's involved with as well. His primary focus of study is on legal history of Iberian monarchies in the early modern period and the global historical perspective of European legal history. He's also interested in the history of ecclesiastical law, which I imagine he uh, in some part got from his Dr. Vater, Peter Landau, and moral theology, especially the Salamanca school, which we previously covered as well as well as the methods of legal history. Uh, also interested in legal history in the early modern era and current age, with a special interest for the history of law in Latin America, as evidenced by this chapter, which we will shortly be covering. And I imagine that much of his interest in Argentina and also such the broader Latin America came from his time at the Pontifical University of Argentina. So without further ado, we'll move to the chapter. So once again, this chapter is in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, edited by Marcus D. Dubber and Christopher Tomlins. And it is in part four, Traditions Tracing Legal History. And it is chapter 43 of the textbook titled Indigenous Rights Latin America. So starting with the introduction. So according to the author, according to international and national constitutional law, 
Indigenous peoples in most Latin American countries have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinct political, legal, economic, social, and cultural institutions. As a consequence of a long process of recognition of their limited legal autonomy, many Indigenous peoples now practice their own laws, cultural traditions, and customs. In doing so, they draw on history and reconstruct, recreate, and even create their identities. And this is a process sometimes called ethnogenesis. At the same time, however, historical research has increasingly pointed out the intense interaction between indigenous peoples and European invaders during the colonial period. And thus it has become clear that many so-called indigenous or colonial legal traditions are more properly seen as hybridizations of indigenous and colonial laws and legal practices. So therefore, what does it mean for our current debate of indigenous rights, indigenous people's rights? In that, if there's much gray area in between what is indigenous and what is colonial. And the aim of this chapter, therefore, is to introduce this historiography and its relevance to law and to present some methodological challenges in writing the history of indigenous rights in Latin America resulting from this fairly recent shift in legal historiography. So it must be noted this um, uh, this characteristic that there's much overlap between the two is sort of a recent acknowledgement, or at least a recent understanding. So therefore, this chapter will start with a short introduction of the recognition of indigenous rights in present and past. In the present and past, this will be section one. Section two surveys the legal historiography of indigenous rights in Latin America emphasizing the cha changing context of historiography, the new interpretation of indigenous people's histories, especially in the colonial period, and recent research in the history of rights of indigenous peoples in Latin America. And section three addresses some, uh, or three in particular, methodological problems of doing research on legal history and the rights of indigenous people. So then there'll be three methodological problems that will be posed at the end in section three. So without further ado, we'll keep s s steaming along here or rolling along here with section one, the recognition of indigenous rights in the present and past. So we kind of get a back story of where we are now. So article five of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples from 2007, often referred to as UNDRIP, which actually is very um, commonly used here, at least in British Columbia, and the Attorney General, UNDRIP is a big reference point. There's a lot of alignment of law work, but it's also seen in other organizations I've noticed, such as, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> the International Criminal Court or the <coughs> Permanent Court of uh, Justice, pardon me. Um, but nonetheless, according to this UNDRIP, indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinct political, legal, economic, social, and cultural institutions while retaining their right to participate fully if they so choose in political, economic, social, and cultural life of the state. The declaration is a culmination of a uh, pardon me, of a long process of a growing recognition of indigenous peoples' rights on an international level as well as on the the level of many national constituent constitutions. As a consequence, many people in Latin America now are claiming and exercising their right to self-determination, practicing their own laws, cultural traditions, and customs. And it's caused uh, looking back into the past in times before the European invasion. So because of this undrip, it's opened up this sort of <coughs> opportunity or necessity to look into history for sort of reasons as to why they might have some of these claims and as we see there's also the applications in north america as well at least i've observed in my own work yet due to migration and imperial expansion of indigenous peoples like the inca it must be noted that there was already a hybridization before europeans had arrived so colonialism this is a big takeaway at least for me from this chapter is that colonialism didn't just became begin when the europeans arrived but there was already colonialism or empires within the Latin America, such as the Incas or Aztecs as well. Europeans imposed culture systems and simultaneously their own law on the conquered, yet some regions more or less affected and some also engaged in intense co cooperation. So even those areas where there was, um, uh, well, even 
uh, analyzing the European um, uh, colonies in isolation, there's still deviations across Latin America. Sometimes it was very strong, just completely obliterating that which existed, but sometimes there was significant co cooperation, and sometimes there was even dependency upon the indigenous peoples in some cases. Spanish and Portuguese crowns pursued distinct colonial policies, though there may be more commonalities than traditionally believed. So often it's like one studies um, the, the Spanish and some studies the Portuguese, at least on uh, West and East uh, um, South America, respectively. But however, there are more commonalities than traditionally believed, as the author Thomas Stuve brilliantly points out. And therefore, the systems are not homogeneous and closed. So there's also even overlap. So even before um, the Pope divided, chose to divide the South America as to avoid wars, there was often a lot of interlap, overlap there as well. And rather, it's structurally open, according to the author. The European Ius Commune, which is common law, or well, translates to common law in Latin, but what that means is not common law as in like the Western tradition of common law, but law that is common to everyone, has shaped by the multi-normative past and until the 18th century characterized by overlapping jurisdictions, provided intellectual and institutional framework for the integration of different legal traditions. So there was already, at the time of the arrival, this U.S. commune. So, for example, if a Portuguese person were to do something to a Spanish person, there's somewhat of a, an international law already at that time, especially considering... Uh, the, uh, the significant travel over the oceans, such in particular the Atlantic Ocean, there needed to be maritime law, which is in some sense a U.S. commune. Concrete legislation for structural openness was, for, was first known from the decree of 1530, and there was an ordering of crown officials to collect information about the order and way of living of the indigenous peoples of New Spain. So this is 1530, this is a very long time ago, almost five hundred years ago, and recognizing their right as, this is 2023 if you're watching this later, recognizing their right to live according to their good practices and customs as long as they were not against the Christian religion. So already in 5030 there was a recognition and a, a call to observe the culture of the, and in effect the laws of the indigenous peoples in at least New Spain. Then later there was a royal decree dating from 1555 from the Spanish, Spanish King Charles V that stated that antidescent indigenous laws as well as those newly enacted would be respected. So this is um, very um, early in the colonial history there was already this recognition of indigenous laws. Some decades later reforms of colonial administration like Viceroy Toledo's Peruvian ordinances granted judicial autonomy to members of indigenous communities in respective settlements. So there's, it's not all just like colonialism, or the Europeans arrived and then just obliteration, but there was also periods of recognition even almost 500 years ago. Even if classified as weak legal pluralism, it is there are important limits to the autonomy granted to the indigenous peoples. A repugnancy clause explicitly accepted those usages and customs that violated the principles of Christianity or royal legislation. So, if anything were to go against particularly Christianity or the royal legislation, they would be uh, Christianity or the crown would take precedence. Yet, as a result of these concessions, as some previous royal laws and decrees dating from early 1500 and the 1512 Leyes de Burgo qualified indigenous peoples as rational persons as well. And later, papal documents of uh, sublimus deus and intense debates on the sta status of indigenous peoples affirmed their condition as human beings and free vassals of the crown, subject to normatives uh, of at least two worlds. So therefore, it was very heterogen heter heterogeneous. So there was, um, they were recognized as peoples under the crown or even under the, the Catholic Church, but also they were evidently recognized as peoples under their indigenous communities. So they're kind of in the mix between two cultures. And therefore we start to see these overlaps, at least coming into the indigenous people. So are they, if you, for example, come across a certain law, was it necessarily completely developed in isolation or was it developed through influence or, and vice versa as well, many of the new, the laws made in the new world. 
If inequality, despite the changes in the 19th century in favor of the powerful groups of the Creole elite and Euro-American society. So it must also be noted it wasn't just always the, the Europeans doing the oppressing. There was also elite groups within the indigenous communities, such as the Creole elite and the Euro-American, Euro in addition to the Euro-American society. Indigenous peoples were the big losers of uh, of the process of eradicating a jurisdiction-centered justice system with provisions for limited autonomy, but nonetheless indigenous rights persisted through practice and often unwritten transmission, shaped or at least influenced daily life in many places. So even if they weren't allowed to write it down or weren't allowed to practice it, it still, they still had um, practiced a law of some form, which leads us to, as, as we'll see, the necessity of studying the oral traditions particularly also in the next chapter, as we'll see from Mitra Sharapi in the reference of Indian law, and that is Indian, the subcontinent, India. In, furthermore, in the fairly recent process of restituting legal autonomy, history has become an important argument. For example, in Bolivia, the most significant experiment in putting political claims of autonomy and pluralism into constitutional practice by far, returning to indigenous traditions predating the colonial period has been a central legitimization for the transformation of the political system. So all of this, why is this chapter in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History? Is that this area of study necessitates a study of history, particularly in pre-colonial times. Article 30 of the 2009 Bolivian Constitution defines the rural native indigenous people and nationality as those human collectives that share a cultural identity language, historic tradition, institutions, territory, and worldview. So they also quantify what it is, and then they can therefore go out and find it. All human collectives whose existence predates the Spanish colonial invasion. In other countries, general tendency has been to base the legal recognition of indigenous peoples on successful claims of ancestral traditions, or at least on their ability to prove certain practices, historical roots in their communities' lives. So there is this sort of need to make the link, otherwise someone could just make up a new law if it wasn't proved through history. Collective and individual property rights are protected wherever the claims can be historically justified. Those are huge, especially also in North America, uh, land claims and title claims. In many specific contexts of current legal life, self-identification based on traditions and concomitantly the history of these traditions in a and as he says, in a word, legal history plays a major role, history, and therefore history has become a constitutive element of constructing the modern legal pluralism. So that is section one. We will proceed to section two, which is the histor historiography of indigenous rights. So in spite of the importance, legal historiography of indigenous rights in Latin America has only recently been given its due, according to the author. For a long time, historians paid limited attention to the fact vivid legal traditions beyond their li the limits of recognized and official law and not simply outdated customs bound to disappear. So for a long time, they thought they were bound to disappear. So there wasn't much need to study it and furthermore, much of a need to study its history. And not in the least, this is due to the domination of Euro-American academic traditions and it remained a blind spot of the discipline, and merely a case for anthropology, not for legal history. So one could, the anthropologists perhaps were looking into this, but the legal historians were not. And this changed dramatically in recent decades, as the author, Thomas Duve, will generously show us. First in section A of part two, changing context of historiography. So brief look at the aspects of changing context of historiography since the 1980s. Most Latin American countries experienced intense process of re-democratization and a new wave of constitutions. Many incorporated transcendent reforms in international law regarding the protection of indigenous rights at the same period. So this is in the 1980s. There's this international law movement which recognizes indigenous people. And this is before UNDRIP as well. International labor organizations adopted adoption of Convention 169, titled Indigenous and Tribal Peoples Convention, or ILO 169, in 1989, so even 
long before UNDRIP, there were these recognitions in international law, and it was ratified by many Latin American countries and made history as a central argument in claiming status and attendant legal privileges of being recognized as tribal peoples of independent countries whose social, cultural, and economic conditions distinguish them from other sections of the national community. And they're regulated wholly or partially by their customs or traditions. So a very significant step in 1989 with Convention 169. Similarly, similarly, the UN General Assembly's adoption of the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2007 elevated a group's self-identification traditions and historical identity formation to the level of a fundamental consideration in determining its status. And these are all transformation, tra uh, transnational indigenous rights movements. So two very significant steps, but must be noted under is two, 2007 is 2023 now. That wasn't very long ago. But 1989 was a little while ago, but in terms of the history, let's say it was 1500 as an arbitrary starting date of colonialization of Latin America, it's far, far later, over three, over 400 years later, almost 500 years later. The political decolonization and intensifying globalization also created the fertile conditions for transnational indigenous rights movements and empowered many local actors. And since the 1980s, many Latin American countries also witnessed a period of economic growth, stronger integration, the world economy, and deregulation. So there's also this other force, which is sort of an internal force. So there's this transnational force. I'd like uh, um, to reference Michael Doyle often. There's the um, peripheral forces and the um, and the peripheral forces are the outside forces and the metropolitan, uh, the metropole forces or metropolitan forces. So the internal forces are that these countries were achieving prosperity, economic growth, stronger integration with the world economy, and deregulation. So they were getting stronger, so perhaps more suitable to in, in, engage in this sort of research. But also these, these international forces such as UNDRIP and Convention 169. And it's uh, labeled the new extractivism, with, where they rely he heavily on the extraction of natural resources. So also the need with the growing economy to extract these natural resources, they've had to go into deeper into indigenous territories and therefore greater contact. And in consequence, many areas not previously or easily or impossible to access have now been reached, home, which are the homelands of many indigenous peoples. They, and they've been sub subjected to greater extraction, but there's also been a downside too. In some cases, there's been a lot of crimes or uh, moral crimes at least and sometimes resulted in even violent conflicts but it's generally getting better and i think it's uh there's it's a it's hard philosophical question so some of these communities for example have never been contacted with the modern world so they still live in hunter-gatherer societies is it ethical to um, engage with them so on the one hand Obviously, it would do them a lot of harm. It would be a cultural shock. They might never be able to integrate. But what if one of them has a sickness that we can cure? Can we just watch them or watch them have a lower life expectancy and not go in and help? So it's kind of nuanced. And I think it should be done to some extent, but not absolutely. And also, we want to kind of make sure it's done right and not too quick as to retain their cultural heritage. And therefore, the histor historical theory and methodology have shifted too. The subaltern history of post-colonial studies have reached even the mainstream in professional academia. So um, post-colonial studies have become mainstream, particularly, I think, largely through the movements in the United States. And the increasing influence of Anglo-American academia and intellectual preferences and race, ethnicity, and identity formation interests have taken hold in Latin America, too. So all these things have strengthened this area of indigenous rights in Latin America and led to a complex process of ethnic def which is they call ethnogenesis, so sort of the forming of, of uh, ethnicity. And since the 1970s, legal anthropology has devoted attention to legal pluralism. And so, as we said, anthropology was sort of in, engaging in these areas, and sort of they almost took it upon themselves to engage in legal pluralism themselves, and more of an epi epiphenomenon of social structure. 
and it's the rise of global history after some delay has finally spread to Latin America, so global history has expanded that way. There is also an Oxford Handbook of European his Legal History, but this is the first, and that's why I selected this book that actually encompasses all world history, so I like that about it, and I, it's, as we see, Latin America has had a bit of a delay. And promoting the decentralizing historical narratives, and it argues for equal opportunities to interpret history and disregards reductionist interpretations and stereotypes uh, in, in colonial perspectives like passivity isolation and undifferentiated marginalization there's also growing respect for indigenous regional logic respecting non-european and north american epistemologies so even understanding more not just their history but also the ways they think has been greater appreciated in recent times the, emerg the emergence of the indigeneity as global identity during the Cold War, along with new communications technologies and greater sensitivity to value of biological and cultural diversity, have provided indigenous people with new opportunities to generate and respond to public attention. So there's obviously the technological factors since the Cold War and various forms of indigenous and re-indigenization processes in Latin America have their own histories rooted even in earlier period, but nonetheless facets of the global phenomenon. So moving to section B of section two, indigenous people's histories. So two monumental events have caused a shift in policy and general scholarly discourse since the 1980s. The 1992 which was the fifth 500th anniversary of the arrival of Europeans in America and a wave of celebrations sweeping across America since 2010 in remembrance of the 200, um, 200 years of independence from Spain. So these two big uh, anniversaries have caused sort of recognition or increased focus on this area. And there's been multiple considerations in legal history teaching of the school of Salamanca which we previously discussed, for a long time considered as an expression of the Spanish struggle for justice in the conquest of America, is now seen as just another face of empire. So for a while it was even seen as the it was a struggle on Spain's behalf, but now it's seen as sort of um, imperialism. Recent scholarship followed on the developments showing only a piece of the longer history of imperial rule especially in the form of Incan and Aztec empires. So not only is it just sort of a, a form or a face of imperialism, there was also imperialism must be recognized in Latin America before the Spanish or Portuguese or others as well arrived. And those are particularly in the form of the Incas and the Aztecs, two great sites which I've been fortunate to see. The Incas, there's Machu Picchu in Peru, absolutely fascinating that they could do such things. There's also, I think, Grant Hancock has some fascinating ideas about not necessarily Machu Picchu that I've heard, but that perhaps there was a wisdom that they came from an older generation, which I think is fascinating. Not necessarily true, but I think it would be fascinating. And as well, the Aztec Empire is near you can see near Mexico City, there are some massive pyramids that they produce, some very, very um, fascinating um, empires nonetheless. And they also colonize other indigenous communities there too. So it's a longer history. And not to discount the, des the devastation but caused by disease, war, subjugation to foreign cultural systems and economic systems, they also replaced existing laws. It was difficult to delineate what underlying legal practices were, and sometimes the superior ruling elites called Kakiukus, Kakikes, Caracas, Macahuelas, and Runa um, were often referenced blood purity or limpieza de sangre, and normally seen as a tool of exclusion against, also used against the elites and served for racial passing. So sometimes, even though there was much. Uh, wrong things going on. There was also a difficulty for those who are mixed blood as well. And there's also, it must be noted, there's a paucity of written sources, a shortage of written sources in this area. And they're also looking into the role of cultural brokers and translators. So what influence do the, the translators and cultural brokers play in shaping history? It's also a field of relevant actors now includes previously ignored groups like the descendants of slaves trafficked from Africa. So there's also an African-American population in 
or not well, African, South American population in Latin America, as well as indigenous women and vagabonds or rosteros who left communities to urban contexts. So there's also these um, subgroups as well. So there's many that stay in their communities, but there's many indigenous people that go into the cities and such, and such or and they have had a different experience and sometimes even lost complete contact with their former cultures. And there's also the uh, African uh, African slaves who had come, and there's also indigenous women, which also deserve special attention. And it was clear that by the end of the Spanish rule in Hispanic America, there was room for the indigenous elites to maneuver shrunk considerably. The Bourbon reforms caused upward social and economic mobility for Creoles. The abortive mass rebellions, like the Tupac Amaru from 1780 to 19 or 1783 resulting in roughly 100,000 casualties, caused further setbacks. And changes in national citizenship, new technologies uh, to rule, uh, uh, like surveying, surveying and the introduction of cadastras, immigration policies, racist and social Darwinist ideology, which we saw particularly in the times of Nazi America, uh, Nazi uh, Germany, and the creation of selective implementation of legal order based on abstraction. And proportional and protection of liberal property rights also developed in the 19th, 19th and early 20th century. So many, many political and sociological shifts during the, the time, even this is post-colonial times. And the emergence of indigenous history in the 20th century has just begun to be written. The author Thomas Duve, Duve notes. Moving to section C of part two, the history of indigenous laws and indigenous people's rights. So the traditional discipline of legal history practiced at law schools in Latin America only partially adopted some more recent views of historiography and integrated them into its analytical framework. Beginning in the early 20th century and later for Brazil, previously state-centered perspectives were predominant, but in the last three decades, history of indigenous rights and law has become a lively field of research in part due to the seminal and provocative studies of Spanish legal historian Barolome Clavero, Barolome Clavero, um, uh, privileges like those which Ius Commune had developed for the so-called miserabiles personae or categories like being native could be applied to blur accepted boundaries such as those from Iberian origin between alleged separate worlds and colonized and colonizers. So there's a, often a, a difficult, uh, a lot of mixture between the Iberians and the indigenous people or any other colonizers and the indigenous peoples for that matter. And moreover, indigenous elites made use of royal courts to defend themselves both against the abuses of local colonial authorities and against other indigenous groups. So there is these indigenous elites who um, did use the, uh, the courts of the colonies uh, to, in their own defense, which is um, perhaps a good thing, but they also used it to target um, less elite indigenous peoples as well. Also, attention to the slaves of African descent, as previously mentioned, had, and, uh, the, had found a use of the ecclesiastical courts, so that's an interesting history in itself as did indigenous people. So these indigenous courts were used by the African, uh, those of African descent, but I also imagine by the elites, but even by normal or non-elites. And even cases of notaries from African descent exist. So those are in interesting individual histories as well. One aspect in, in context uh, for this chapter is the indigenous people's use of royal and ecclesiastical courts influence indigenous law itself. So that's an important takeaway. So if perhaps we see an indigenous law, but perhaps it's a reflection of the royal or ecclesiastical courts. Similarly, Spaniards defending themselves against indigenous claims sometimes cited pre-conquest law. So here's where we get to the other side. So the Spanish sometimes when creating laws in the colonies, they looked at what was already existed, or that which already existed in the colonies. So there's a mixture on both sides. Royal, ecclesiastic, and indigenous blend, therefore, we can see, and therefore it can be called interlegality. Not only, and this doesn't only exist in the superior courts, 
studies do pertain to specific location and periods as well, but racial passing and flexible ascriptions to groups exist and clearly indicate a porous boundaries and considerable dynamic exchange. So there's um, obviously, as you know, it's racial passing, a mix of across races, but also there's um, different courts, different, and they have different mixes across different locations. There's just so much to look so much to look into so i'm very grateful for thomas do for cover for attempting to you know, en encompass all of these broad massive areas of research and moving to s short section d of part two methodological challenges so these developments call for some remarks on the key challenges for future research regarding method to the extent to the ex to the extent historiography is only dedicated to the past, legal past, specializing in different modes of law and the historical functions, three aspects seem noteworthy. Multinormativity, freezing differences, and nothing pure. So pardon me for the structure. So section D is kind of the way he structures this chapter. is kind of an introduction to section three. So uh, um, uh, yeah, nonetheless, if I would say student, maybe I'd suggest maybe moving section D as an introduction to section three. But nonetheless, if you purchase the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, um, maybe you might see this as well. And so moving to section three, multi-normativity. So this is one of the three um, uh, aspects, especially noteworthy. So the concept of legal pluralism is popular, but it is not unproblematic, notes the author. It succeeded in de destabilizing the state-centered perspectives on the past and the legal regimes which tend to be legalistic and sometimes anachronistic and Eurocentric beyond the mere Western modernity. So there is this benefit of legal pluralism, which we've discussed many times before in previous chapters. However, in the case of indigenous people's law in the colonial period, it might lead to some misunderstanding of the complex and profoundly different ways of administering justice. The off-sided practice of forum shopping among jurists, where jurists pick a, pick a court that fits their desired outcome, even replacing plural with inter, and the problem with legal and legality remain. So, um, legal so legal pluralism is first as a problem, but you could, and also the word legal is a problem as well. So, nonetheless, we'll explain why legal pluralism, while it's of course got many benefits, and as we've seen, it it moved away from the state-centered and Eurocentric models, it's also got its benefits. So normativity is a solution, at least for the legal term, and whereas state-centered in some local customs, the religious normativity too excludes right and religious obligations, and research needs analytical tools to grasp the underlying assumptions about consensual normativities that affect all sorts of cultural reproductions. So that's the issue with the word legal, is that legal implies a sort of Western uh, view. Therefore, normativity is sort of the, the study of the sort of the first principles, or what, rather than just what is legal, what, or rather than legal, look at what is legal across the different groups. And some of these phenomena have been addressed by the recent French, soci uh, recent French sociology conventions, and the suggestions, the combination of two perspectives. The norm theoretical approach of normative and jurisdictional pluralism and interlegality, along with the more action theoretical approach of sociology of conventions, and therefore dig beyond legal pluralism. An open concept like multi normativity, so it's like multi normatives, is uh, even broader, according to the author Thomas Duve, which is designed to analyze situations of translating normativities in diverse epistemistic settings and they might help reconstruct this. So that's a solution. So it points out a, a difficulty, but offers a solution. So I think that's one of the, the great signs of a great mind is it's easy to point out a lot of problems, but it's a one thing, it's another to pro promote or to provide a solution. Now, uh, issue number two out of three, freezing differences. So another specific danger of the current re-indigenization by jurisdiction is intimately related to historical discourse. The fallacy of essentializing the identities, traditions, and practices of groups that have succeeded in establishing themselves as relevant actors. As indigenous people are usually identified genealogically, 
the conservation of their social practices, customs, traditions, and self-identification, as we saw in ILO 169, bears a certain danger of freezing the differences in a sense of creating seemingly stable historical identity through law. So this is to, at least in my mind, so let's say we identify certain law. Are we preventing it from developing in the future? Or let's say we find something even in the past, have we will we take something from the present and revert it back to the past or the, the main thing is the freezing of the differences further in order to obtain recognition of indigenous peoples cultural stereotypes and preferences often prevail that romanticize and exoticize their reference or perpetuate the privilege other cultural patterns so just because they're um, this uh, something looks good is often frozen but then it cannot be changed as well and they run the risk of being trapped in their own traditions without the opportunity to develop productively. This re the risk of sounding indelicate, according to the author, the driving force between the process of recognizing indigenous people's rights is not so much the desire to restore historical tradition, but simply the political calculation to grant more autonomy to certain groups that succeeded in asserting their claims in the political debate. So I think that's a very profound and important way of putting it. The objective is not just to restore, to restore the historical traditions. Of course, we want to find all the historical traditions, but the real objective is to give them the autonomy. So to give them autonomy with the wrong tools would not be correct. And in the long run, it might be inevitable to admit this, according to the author Thomas Dew. But this is a challenging thing, but I experienced much significant work with indigenous groups in North America, and I think that is what they would more more would want. It's important though that the history, historical traditions are all found. We don't want them to be lost, but they don't have to be forced to use their historical traditions. But when they're of merit, they should of course be included. But the main thing is their autonomy. So moving to the last one, so the third of the issues, but it's actually section five. So the three, um, the three issues are section uh, three, four, and five. So. And section D is the introduction. So it's a, a strange formatting, but nonetheless, I hope you're following. And this, we're still in, we're in the last section, nonetheless. So the third issue is that nothing is pure. A final provocative question of the major significance of legal history is related to the continuous transformation of legal traditions, to the flexibility of collective ascriptions that constitute and reconstitute themselves, and the inevitable interrelatedness of their normative orders. Is there any even such a thing as indigenous rights? Is a question the author poses because there's so much overlap. He notes that obviously they obviously do exist, at least in a conceptual sense, as evidenced by actors invoking them in claim and arguing about their context. So if they can be argued for, they must exist. It should be clear that there are no pure traditions, especially in legal spaces that are in at least intermittent contact with normative systems European. The problem lies in the fiction of purity and the historical stability. Even if actors do not claim, as does the Bolivian constitution, traditions whose existence predates the Spanish colonial invasion. So even if we go back before the colonial invasion, uh, European invasion, there would still be some mixture, for example, was there Incas enforcing law on other indigenous groups? Perhaps. But I, I think it's there obviously exists indigenous rights somewhere. How to deal with this is given the national and international law supposes the existence of these indigenous laws. The trigger relates is related and trigger related processes of ethnogenesis and tradition building. Legal history would do well to draw its attention to the fundamental conceptual problems that arise from this kind of history in judicial context. This entails fostering debates about how different epistemic, epistemic traditions clash in court, not only from a theoretical perspective, but also considering the problematics of judicial context. It might therefore be necessary to reflect more, reflect more deeply on the what is variously referred to as forensic legal history, a methodological reflection on the use of legal history in court. So rather than assuming in, his solution to assuming that everything is pure he says nothing is pure and therefore look at forensic legal history so look into the details behind it not to say that these things will not be used but they must take a forensic account of where did it come from why did it happen was it in response to this european group or this uh, indigenous group 
So, nonetheless, that's a brilliant chapter by Thomas Duve. I very much thank the author for producing this and the editors of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, Marcus Dubber and Christopher Tomlins, for bringing this author into the group of great authors in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History. So without further ado, we will discuss the slide briefly before moving to the chapter by Mitra Shuraki. So his position is a law professor and director of the Max Planck Institute for Legal History and Legal Theory. And his institution, where he is a law professor, is the Goethe University, Frankfurt. Suggested readings include Global Legal History, Setting Europe in Perspective, published in the Oxford Handbook of European Legal History, published by the Oxford University Press in 2018. Knowledge and the Pragmatici, Legal and Moral Theological Literature and the Formation of Early Modern Ibero-America, published by the Max Planck Institute, in Global Legal History in Iberian Worlds, Volume 1, edited by Thomas Duve and Otto Danworth, published by Brill Nyhoff in 2020. And pardon me, it's in the book titled Max Planck Institute in Global Legal History of Iberian Worlds. Research interests include legal history of Iberian monarchies in early modern, the early modern period, global historical perspective on European legal history, ecclesiastical law and moral theology, the Salamanca School, methods of legal history, and Latin American indigenous rights. In terms of the logos, we have here in the bottom right the Heidelberg University, the uh, bottom middle the Pontifical University of Argentina, the bottom left the Ludwig Maximilian University of Midwick, the, uh, Munich, pardon me, the top right, the Munich School of Philosophy, IHS, that's the translation for Munich School of Philosophy. Uh, the top center is the uh, famous Max Planck Institute, and in the top left, we have the Goethe University of Frankfurt. In terms of the quotes, we have, thus it has become clear that many of the so-called indigenous or colonial legal traditions are more properly seen as hybridizations of indigenous and colonial law and legal practices. Quote two, in many specific contexts of current legal life, self-identification based on tradition and concomitantly the history of these traditions, in a word, legal history plays a major role. And the third and last quote, for a long time, legal historians have paid only limited attention to the fact that indigenous peoples have vivid legal traditions beyond the limits recognized by official law and were not simply practicing outdated customs that were bound to disappear. So once again, this is a chapter by Thomas Duve in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, Section 4, Traditions, Tracing Legal History, and it is Chapter 43, Indigenous Rights, Latin America. We will talk more about the author in the comparison after discussing the uh, chapter by and the bi biography of Mitra Sharafi. So, starting with the biography of Mitra Sharafi, so she is a legal historian of modern South Asia. She received her Bachelor of Arts in History from McGill University in Canada in 1996. She received her Bachelor of Arts in Law at Cambridge University in 1998, her Bachelor of Civil Law at Oxford University in 1999, which is Oxford's equivalent of a LLM, and a PhD in History at Princeton University in 2006. She taught university at the she at the University of which she is teaching and has taught at the University of Wisconsin Madison School of Law and Legal Studies program since 2007, and she's the Yuju Evjue Bascom Professor of Law. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Evjue Bascom Professor of Law. Her first book was titled Law and Identity in Colonial South Asia: Parsi Legal Con Culture. 1772 to 1947, which was the winner of the Law and Society Association's 2015 Hearst Prize. She's now working on her second book, Fear of the False, Forensic Science in Colonial India. She also published two articles, one on bloodstain testing, which was the winner of the Law Society Association's 2010 article prize, and another on abortion in Colonial India. Her next major project will examine the world of non-European law students from across the British Empire and world, who came to London's Inns of Court to become barristers in the 1860s and 1960s. I think that's fascinating because I have friends who are barristers at the Inns of Court in London, but they are not actually 
or they weren't necessarily born in England, so that would be really relevant to her writing. Research has been funded by the American Council of Learned Societies, the Institute for Advanced Study, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Science Foundation, and the Social Science Research Council, SHRC it's called in Canada, and mostly, most recently received the ACLS Frederick Buchart Residential Fellowship of eight, 2018, and the National Humanities from the National Humanities Center, as well as the Davis Cent Center Fellowship from Princeton History Department, and the H.I. Romers Faculty Fellowship from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her research in interests include South Asian legal history, history of criminal law and forensic science, history of legal education and the legal profession, colonialism and empire, the history of contract law, law and society, law and religion, law and minorities, legal consciousness, legal pluralism, the history of law books, and the history of science and medicine. So, very fantastic background in terms of her academic progressions. It's very, very, really quite impre impressive. Um, so, in terms of the introduction uh, to her chapter, so at the, uh, so once again, her chapter is in part four of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History. I'll show it again if you're just, pardon me, if you're just jump, jumping in at this part. The Oxford Handbook of Legal History, edited by Marcus D. Dubber and Christopher Tomlins. It is chapter 44. It is in section four, Traditions Tracing Legal History, chapter 44, titled Indian Law. And the author is Mitra Sharafi, Dr. Mitra Sharafi, of course. So introduction, it was produced at the University of Wisconsin Law School. The author thanks the members of the South Asia Legal Studies Working Group, particularly Cynthia Farid, Aripta Gupta, James Jaff, Elizabeth Lost, Mark Gallanter, Sunhil Rao, and Mark Siddell. And her writing group, Tanya Brito, Gwendolyn Leachman, and David S. Schwartz for their comments. The author is also grateful to Nicholas J. Abbott, Rohit De, Le Donault, and, and Tun Tushna Thaplia, Thapliao for their thoughts. AIRSC stands for All India Reporters Supreme Court um, yeah, for the course of this chapter, but I think I probably use the full term anyways. And the chapter was written in 2017. So what does the Jobism with this quote or what do, or this question? What does the future hold for the field of Indian legal history, which has burgeoned since the late 1990s? This chapter explores the opportunities for methodological innovation through digital history, oral history, and collaborations between scholars. These approaches these approaches promise to counterbalance certain patterns that have developed to date, particularly the heavy reliance on written English language records from the colonial period. So starting with section one titled The Long Shadow of Colonialism. So the author notes, Mitra Sharafi, within the field of Indian legal history, the colonial period dominates. Focus has been on British India from the late 18th century until independence in 1947 and on the history of religion and gender in India's various personal law systems. So the author questions, why have or poses the question why have scholars fixated on this era rather than before or after the answer lies in the colonial archive it is voluminous comparatively well preserved and relatively accessible in britain and india although preservation efforts still are needed so even though it is probably the most available it still needs more work as the study of Indian legal history has become increasingly populated by historians since the 1990s, archival features have shaped the field more than during the second half of the 20th century, when scholars tended to be academic lawyers less focused on archival research. So archival research has caused some improvements, however. The second explanation relates to language. The preference for English language or lack of fluency in other ling ing Indian languages push towards British India. This possibility inter, uh, intersects with the problems of limited access to and comparatively poor preservation of non-English language sources. It may be impossible to separate language preferences from source idea it, from the source issue, yet relying on non-English primary sources would allow scholars to better explore a host of themes and venues including non- and quasi-state religious law. 
legal consciousness reflected in popular song, films, and street play, the legal culture of princely, princely states, and stepping away from source in English, along with Persian and Sanskrit for that matter. So even Persian and Sanskrit receives more um, attention than some uh, of the, the languages of in India. Would also enable scholars to trade a pan-India framing for a focus on regional and community specific specific legal cultures. I have it written down somewhere later, but I believe there's, um, I don't know I have it off the top of my head precisely how many language, but there's over 20 major languages in India. I, I think it's around 22 or even 23. One could protest legal history is by definition state-centric, and that if one wants to study law in modern Indian history, the core text will be in English, perhaps. This exploration may hold for some case law at the apex courts of all India legislation, but it becomes less and less compelling as one moves from the colonial to the princely state courts before 1947, from the all India to the local level and from the state to the non-state. Finally, it may be colonial legal history dominates because of academia's self-replicating mechanics. Faculty members who specialize in colonial period have attracted graduate students interested in the same area, era, so self-perpetuating, and have steered students in the, their, this direction given the advisor's own expertise. In addition, language skills for less commonly taught South Asian languages, meaning all languages other than Hindi, Urdu, Sanskrit, and Persian, are often hard to acquire at universities outside of India. Together, these factors may have funneled scholars, particularly outside India and, and of in non-Indian background, into the study of British India. So there's also this academic forces, but also so there's this caveat that perhaps it's by definition legal history is to look at the state-centric approach. And as we saw, for example, the Qing Dynasty in China is often researched because it's the last, so therefore it's the culmination. Um, but that's uh, it's it's clearly neglecting other aspects. Within histori historiography of India's colonial legal history, two questions stand out. One, who won when colonized people won cases in colonial courts, a version of scholars in England where uh, the courts were rigged in the favor of the elites could be uh, seen as parallel, as Marxist scholars suggest in the 1970s, or arena for struggle where non-elites could find a voice to protect their interests. So this first question of historiography um, is that w w even if um, these P Indian people would go to the state courts, were they were they being forced to go to court? Were they actually winning, or were they 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 um, bending the knee to the uh, state? Um, uh, that would be the Marxist solution. Um, or the arena of struggle where non-elites could find their voice to protect their interests, as Hendrik Hertog, Hartog and others have argued. Could there be another equally compelling way to understand this experience? We will explore. Next question. Uh, furthermore, did the Indian litigants win or by occasionally winning a case against the state or British parties, or did the state win by forcing litigants to fight out these conflicts within the state's own system, as alluded to? And therefore, it's seen as like a pressure valve, where it's the pressure builds up, take them to court, and then they get away with it, basically. Not the defendants, but the, the state gets away with it. And then the other question, too, is the continu debate of continuities. How did this change in independent India? There is racial difference became a less, as racial di um, difference became less a prominent theme, but communalism, casteism, and colorism did not. What did India's post-1950 era do with its written constitution? So there's these continuities. Were there big shifts, or are they just is the caste system an extension of the colonial period? Or is a big question. And when elites like sex trade workers and Muslim butchers uh, asserted their constitutional rights, how should we understand the rise uh, of public interest litigation in the wake of India's temporary slide into the authoritarianism during Indira Gandhi's emergency in 1975 to 1977. So very big questions that have to be tackled. Therefore, furthermore, if the courts were open arenas for conflict, then they were a gate, then the gateway question of access to courts also becomes important. Scholarly histories of legal aid and pro bono work in India are important projects that scholars have only be 
just begun to explore, petitioning cultures and a judici a, a judiciary bodies like the panchayats or case or community councils shaped the evolution of colonial legal systems. So you can't just look at the state because there is these adjudicate adjudicatory bodies. Both who won and the colonial continuities debate may overstate the divide between the colonial and the non-colonial. So once again, as we've seen in many uh, previous chapters, this colonial period is not necessarily a binary component. There is also these um, um, who won, won debate and the continuities debate both before and after and across the colonial and non-colonial divide. And represent, she does note, the author does note, they represented far ends of the spectrum rather than a closed or binary set of options. Legal historians at their best have recognized that, that most of what they examine comes from the concoction in the middle. Some of the field's richest work has explored the points of fusion and repurposing of Anglo institutions that took a new life in India along with the India Indian concepts that adapted to the new conditions under colonial rule. So once again, as we saw in the previous chapter, this sort of a, um, a, a synergy between the two in that they, they for, sort of feed off each other. Despite uh, the attention already paid to colonial India, remain uh, remain further issues to explore. We need more research on local and specialty courts, such as the salt courts and railway courts, the lower levels uh, of the legal profession, women in the legal profession, and law and military during the colonial period. So even though the colonial period has been um, more so studied than the pre-colonial period, it's still there's still gaps in this area too. The intersection between legal history and a number of subfields within history are also ripe for research. These include the intersection where history of law meets the history of book and print culture, the history of the administrative state, environmental history, the history of science, technology and medicine, including disaster and sound studies, and the history of intoxicating substances, the history of material culture, including legal dress, furniture, and other law props and symbols, and the history of architecture, the city, and space, including legal geography. So all very fascinating topics which our author has been kind to, or have been uh, uh, fantastic in at least researching in her own part, in her, on her own part, so at least we can get a, a touch or a glimpse of their importance. Historians of colonial India of Indian law should also cultivate a greater awareness of socio-legal studies, an interdisciplinary body of scholarship produced by academic lawyers and social scientists. So there's many chapters that I previously covered, such as law underscore society and um, law and economics and such. So these are all important areas of study that could be brought and should be brought to the Indian context. And despite a rich scholarship fostered by the Commission of on Legal Pluralism and the Journal of Legal Pluralism and unofficial law since the 1970s and 1980s, historians of India only discovered the concept of legal pluralism once it was shepherded into the discipline by Lauren Benton in 2002. Other concepts developed by socio-legal scholars are waiting to be put in, to be put to better use by legal historians. These include the study of legal consciousness. How do people decide they have a legal rather than a social problem? So that's legal consciousness, whether it's defining whether it's legal or not legal. And the social reception of the legal outcomes, including those mediated through social movements. Many of these same themes are equally underexplored and for the post-colonial period, such that scholars may avoid the traditional periodization of working either pre or post-1947. Not only has 1947 traditionally acted as a divider between the historical periods of study, it has also functioned as a disciplinary boundary segregating historians from political scientists. So those uh, political scientists have tended to focus on the uh, latter period, whereas legal, hist or, sorry, uh, legal historians have focused more on the former. Increasingly, though, historians since the new millennial are look, working on both sides of the Indian independence, carving out a period that makes more sense for their subject to study than the political full stop and start at August 15th, 1947. So nonetheless, the, the, the legal historians have perhaps, or the historians have started to bridge the gap across this divide, but nonetheless, the author sees it as 
so did the political scientists focus more on one side often and the, uh, the legal historians often focus on the other side but they're both sort of bridging gaps and they also both need to come together and we do have there is a chapter on uh, I believe it's called law and uh, politics or uh, or something like that there's a chapter in that I've covered political science and law which I encourage you to watch as well so moving to section two the future of Indian legal history section a the early modern Indian and digital humanities so how, the author Mitra Sharafi dr. Mitra Sharafi notes the, posed the question how should Indian legal history move beyond the bulge of colonial historiography the early legal history of early modern India is much less populated era of study than its colonial counterpart Scholarship on legal history of the Mughal Empire, the dominant power in early modern India, is a much smaller body of work than the legal history of other Asian empires of the same period, particularly the Ottoman and King. So I've also covered in a, a, a very fascinating two chapters, I, I found at least, the Islamic legal history and Chinese legal history. So at least in the Islamic context, there was a significant focus on Ottoman legal history, but much neglect of the Mughal Empire. As well, we saw in the Chinese legal history, the king much focus on the Qing dynasty, but fewer on the others. And this pattern partly reflects the availability of primary sources, where Mughal legal history lacks the richness of records as the Ottoman legal history with its caddy court records, or imperial China with its Qing dynasty legal code. So that's the part of it, which we referenced in the previous chapters, is the, the availability of archives or primary sources, and perhaps the Mughal system was also less centralized, so harder to study because the legal history, she knows it, perhaps in essence is about a state-centered approach, so if it's less centralized, it's harder to analyze. That said, even the sources that exist are underused, housed largely on catalog and in regional Indian archives in Indian contexts. Therefore, digital humanities tools are especially useful here. Network analysis may illuminate connections between individuals of families appearing in early modern sources, including merchants, religious figures, courtiers, judges, and others involved in using or structuring the law. A hub of early modern sources from the, so so pardon me, from the same local to form a basis for digital mapping, project to reconstruct aspects of social spatial life. So these technological tools to create a sort of social map of the area with the ability to highlight environmental, residential, commercial, or religious sites. Could show changes over time using a map with a sliding timeline. So she's really visioned this in her head. So I encourage some computer science student, perhaps I could do it, but it would take me many, way too many hours, but to produce a sliding timeline where you can see the changes of, for example, uh, the case of residential laws over time over an area. I think it would be fascinating and also uh, now possible through technological tools. Text analysis as well can illuminate the migration and permutation of legal terms and concepts across time and territory. So to pick a term, for example, and to view it across many different periods, see it has changed over time. Digitization of manuscript sources are also of great value, so turning them into a digital form. Rajasthan, which I've been fortunate to visit, um, um, Jaipur and Udaipur. Um, Rajasthan is a province in India. They have the famous Pink Palace. I went there on a humanitarian trip and when I was in high school. I really beautiful went during the wet season, so lots of mosquitoes, but absolutely beautiful. Great food, too. But uh, also a lot of poverty. We were building a school there, too, but they're as happy as can be. So, um, well, you know, one can always be happy, so don't, um, that's maybe. Uh, don't discount that, but nonetheless, uh, Rajasthan and Andhra Pradesh state archives are making great efforts to digitize their early modern collections. There's a need also to take a step back and make available on the internet and have computer searchable catalogs and holding. So it's one thing to make them digital, it's also to make them available to many people, um, particularly on the internet. So maybe you have a digital source, but only the government can use it, then it's not very much use or well it's of use but perhaps not of uh, most democratic use. It must note also it amplifies the biases of sources. Digitization only makes more accessible documents already selected for preservation in the physical archive. So there's a double bias here. Firstly, it had to already be written 
for it to be digitized. And then firstly, only the most important sources are digitized first. So it's a, almost a triple bias. Also, there's political motives involved. And the same is true as in medieval Europe with the colorful manuscripts. The Balachandran and Pinto noted private papers have not been prioritized in one South Indian archive because of the legal ambiguity surrounding the archive's relationship with family donors. So there's sort of these, uh, not necessarily political, but these uh, forces that are preventing some from getting digitized. And also, as we saw in um, you know, medieval Europe, there's, and you can check out perhaps medieval canon law would be the best chapter to look into that, is that the, the ones that were digitized were the great and the colorful, but n neglected some of the non-great, but maybe more important um, and not colorful ones. And therefore, digitizing early modern Indian legal sources still addresses the misbalance between post-colonial and colonial periods versus the pre-colonial. And uh, also, the uh, question also is, who is to fund all this? The Indian federal and state governments, um, the author notes, do have a, a, an obligation to do this. The taxpayers are paying tax dollars, and I'm sure some proportion of taxpayers would like this, or... Uh, some taxpayers do want some portion of their money alternatively to go to this, um, but there's also competing demands within the government, so they cannot just dedicate the entire budget to that. That would be impractical. The international, there's also international and non-state actors like the British Library or the Ford Foundation or other options. On one hand, the involvement may raise questions of Indian so India's sovereignty and control over its own cultural heritage, because would this not be the British or the American coming in and um, engaging in something colonial once again, or will they not have a bias? And But and, but mu must be noted, this is still time-sensitive. Preservation is paramount, and S.R. Marota and Dinyar Patel assert international funding is necessary for the digitization of the vast Da 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 Naroji Na collection. So, um, there's, I think, even if perhaps there might be biases, for example, the British Library, it's still there's a necessity to get on this quick before they deteriorate anymore. So, um, I think everything should be digitized, even even things that are not necessarily good it should still be digitized. So, but the point is, are, is how can we get the gaps of the things that are being neglected? There's also the private domestic sector too. Under Indian law, company law, businesses with annual revenues over 10 billion rupees, which is 150 million uh, US dollars, must now give 2% of their net profits to charity. So that's a really uh, uh, profound law. That's, uh, I know that does not exist in the Canada or the United States. Um, but it's got its purpose, but it also might incentivize people to not do business in India, but India is such a big country that it would be impractical to move operations to a, a different company just to save 2% of profits. And also, if anyone's familiar with accounting, there are ways that you can just not let it go to the profit line, expense it out, bring it before the line. So, But nonetheless, 2% of profits to charity, uh, starting at 150 million profit, is um, 3 million. It's pretty good. Um, so, and also the Naroji papers are a prime example because of their association with the Parsi community, which have, are capable of and of uh, saving these sources. So, moving to the next section, section B, independent I India and oral history. The, so, particularly, uh, yeah, oral history, we'll see here. The legal history of independent India is better populated and more active field than its early modern counterpart. Perhaps not the only, not only historians and lawyers, but also political scientists, anthropologists, and sociologists write about this latter period more too. Here are also exi um, existing methodological possibilities for future research. In particular, oral history is underused and offers a new way of the into the lived experiences of law, particularly for the period of history too recent or sensitive to be well documented or accessible in the written archives. Despite oral history's ascendant since the 1970s and its new world of tools and platforms created by the digital revolution, very little has been done by legal historians in India. 
there it remains a focus there remains a focus on written sources and through disciplinary training and culture many feel discomforted in the mutability and fallibility of memory so there's sort of a bias against using oral history because memory can be skewed and also there's some perhaps bias biases but this is true also for written sources and it's not always written sources to match oral source so perhaps if they both exist you can compare the two and see where the biases exist but sometimes where there only is an oral source you see, I think it's still important to get it and I, I still advocate what I said earlier all sources are important even if it's got a bad outcome um, and they, therefore they must analyze each on its own terms so look at the oral is it bias is there some issues memory look at the written source is there issues uh, as well and the focus on meaning rather than on factual accuracy as well a traditional way to start would be to record interviews with legal professionals, particularly senior legal luminaries, willing to reflect upon their careers and times. So this is important, I think, might have got, um, got under the radar by uh, perhaps a few readers, um, almost, uh, I almost did, but uh, by looking at the senior legal luminaries is important because their career um, they well they've got span further into past in time so they've got a longer history but also it's important to get to them now because they perhaps might um, retire or pass away before the junior and so it's important to get to them and that's sort of the time um, restriction here as well as done in South Asian legal studies the author notes it's worth fine-tuning the approach by adopting the protocols and best practices for conducting, preserving, disseminating interviews. So there needs to be a structure of doing this, at least to make them equal, if not detrimental. And what the most obvious project would focus on meeting lawyers and judges during and in the aftermath of Indira Gandhi's emergency. Also an idea to interview legal professionals and officials in order to reconstruct institutional histories. A variety of specialty courts, like the Motor Accident Claims Tribunal, established in 1959, the National Consumer Disputes Redressal Commission, established in 1986, illuminate, and we can illuminate their histories too through oral tradition, oral history as well. And these deserve more attention, the author notes. The, a broader approach consists of oral history interviews of litigants and social movement actors, as well as legal professors, professionals. For example, former princely families on the famous Privy Purse case of 1971, where a lawsuit challenged the government's failure to honor agreements made with the formerly independent princely rulers who gave up power and allowed their polities to become part of the independent India in 1947. So these people are, many of them are still alive, um, they're evidently quite a bit older, or at least their children have heard a lot about it. 1947 is a little, a little while, uh, while past, that would be uh, almost 50 years older than I, so yeah, in their 70s, so there's still many. Uh, could also look at the victims and nonprofit organizations involved in the Bofal a disaster of 1984, which was the world's lar worst industrial accident to date. So these people, are, many of them are still alive, so we can use oral because a lot, a lot of them did not write this down. Uh, oral histories related to sex selective abortion or transnational surrogacy to create a rich body of primary sources too. So particularly on sex selective abortions, perhaps if they prefer a, a male or a female, most commonly a, a male, they might abort a female, which uh, oral traditions could more easily capture than written. Now on a oral history association of India exists to encourage more of this. There is already extensive work in the 1947 partition and independence of India. Admittedly, institutional challenges of oral legal history exist. Graduate students in history departments do not usually receive training in oral history. It's sort of more of almost a, uh, the psychologists receive the most, um, are, are perhaps some of the best at getting oral history out of people because they're trained at um, dialogue. The exception are those in fields of indigenous peoples and African history. So in African history and indigenous peoples, man, many um, experts that I know in the Canadian government and non-government, they they are experts in communication to get the, uh, the oral traditions from indigenous people. 
and short courses exist, for example, the Columbia Oral History Program, Columbia University Oral History Program, and the Science History Institute offer training in the United States, as do the Oral History Society and the British Library's National Life Science Life Stories in the United Kingdom, although these are uh, exceptions because there's not that many of these, but it's great that these exist, but they are, once again, outside of India. It is important to adhere, adhere to ethical standards. In the U.S. Institutional Review Board, approval is necessary from the home university to uh, engage in such work, and it's formed to prevent abuse, abuse of human subjects by researchers that occurred during the Holocaust. Medical and other scientific fields also apply to oral standards as well. So, for example, doctors are trained in how to communicate, or at least family doctors, family physicians are trained in how to deal with the patients. IRB approval can be time consuming, challenging, and confusing, however, and therefore oral history may be um, made more difficult, but therefore, but at least done more properly. But uh, there was discussions that they might actually remove oral history from the IRB, the U.S. Institutional Review Board. But um, I think um, I, I think the author had somewhat of a positive idea on this that it should be removed. But I think it's important that there are some standards, and I think uh, the author, Mitra Sharafi, would agree. But I'd be interested to hear what she uh, what she does think. Uh, moving to section C, laws reach. So the history of Indian case law has burgeoned as legal historian, historians have begun using courts as archives over the past decade. Scholars have unearthed case files buried in records rooms, storage warehouses or go-downs as they're called, and functioning courtrooms themselves, including the Supreme Court of India and the High Court of Bombay, Madras, and Allahabad. Also, we discovered records from the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, the highest court of appeal for the British Empire, and the Indian court archives neither easy or to access nor well preserved. And it's also laborious to access these. Criticism that focuses on rare experiences of appellate litigation over everyday work of lower courts. So there's a focus on firstly superior courts, but also the interesting cases too. So even within the Supreme Court, there's bias. And it's easy to forget law is more is about more than just courts. It's also about the legal culture and consciousness, legislation, regulation, policing, and punishment. Legal pluralism reminds us that law is not solely produced by the state. Other forms of norms and dispute resolution exist. Non-state religious law, also with customary law and councils like the Panchayat, Mel or Salish, reached into rural and non-elite communities that may have never even seen inside the courtroom. So it's important to look not even beyond the courtrooms themselves, but into these alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. Legal folkways, not always documented, making oral history, again, of special value. Fundamental tension at the heart of Indian legal history is the disjunct disjunction between elite legal institutions, particularly courts, and most of the population on the other, and therefore how to square English language, common law work of appellate courts with everyday lived experiences of hundreds of millions of over a dozen vernacular languages and often urban settings. Exceptions like working class women who obtained divorces in Bombay's colonial courts and slum dwellers who made their cases before the Supreme Court in the 1980s. So there are some success story where um, those from the slums or um, working class women did take it to the Supreme Court, but many of them have never seen inside of a courtroom. The question of how far did courts reach into the lives of non elites is a question that also the Amer Anglo American world also looks into. And were courts already arenas of conflict for everyone, or were they only for the elites, or it did it vary over time, which is also likely true. Even those who did make it to court, there were delays, and they could uh, and they could have felt the forces and the reach of the law often blunted. A major problem since if it has if this has been a major problem since the colonial period, and years or decades before the litigation concluded in cases. So many of them were prolonged and dra dra uh, were dragged on for so long that they um, almost wanted to quit and they therefore cause a necessity of alternative litigation. They, there's a term called punitive litigating, which is meant the process itself was punishment. 
which is an age-old issue, not just in India. Even those who did go to court, how their voices can be heard through the carefully planned scripts and advice of lawyers, so the higher gun lawyer. So let's say we have a text of, for example, some working class woman at the Supreme Court. Is it really her own words or is she scripted from her lawyer, perhaps a pro bono lawyer from the government even? And formal law, therefore, is not sufficient. Counter argument that was a counter argument that was even with the interactions with state filtered through the bureaucracy of police were nonetheless life shaping. So even though there was all these filters, to have access to the courts was life shaping and still necessary. Police or other organs of state in illegal slums like street hawkers still meant the law was felt even if only rarely det directly interacted. So this is where we go even further into the law's reach. So let's within the slum there will there are even likely but there definitely are still street hawkers so there's still even if someone has never gone to court the law is still in there that's the, that's the reach of the law the law still reaches them scholars should explore these questions about reach another approach rather than the state and non-state state block um, where they block each other out is the interactive view for example in north india today caste councils known as Kapuchayats have come into conflict with state conflict with state law for allegedly ordering rape as a punishment and condoning honor killings for exogeny. So there's also this interaction between state and state, and many in the independence movement embraced the Puchayats as an institution, and post-colonial governments again experimented with state bolted versions in the 20th century. Therefore, has this has state law been broad and deep in India? So to what extent does the state even control these courts as we saw these horrendous things done by some of these Puchayats in North India? And the collaboration between scholars of Indian legal history may offer the field new ways to tackle these questions. So this is an, uh, not just a, a comparative legal studies within India, especially considering India is so massive, there needs to be comparative within even north, south, east, west, kind of north, kind of south. There's still so many, so many different dialects, so many different experiences and all coming down to the reach of law. And moving to the last of the uh, ABCDs, section D, collaboration, and this is in ABCD of section two, uh, titled collaboration, so which kind of alluded to in section C. So most scholars have focused on one end or the other of the legal pluralist spectrum. Rediscovering the archival records of India's highest courts to illuminating non-state dispute re resolution in panchayats and non-state religious courts. So there's sort of a big dichotomy. There's those focusing just on the, the highest sources and just those taking the most, perhaps maybe even, I guess we could call it forensic, the most down in, kind of in the dirt, non-state uh, oral uh, approach. And how to bridge the gap between the state and the non-state is the question posed by the author, Dr. Mitra Sharafi. Through co-authorship, scholars could produce truly interdisciplinary work, so co-authorship, like legal history using anthropological, archival, and ethnological, ethnographic methods, particularly important in multilingual India across religions. Scholars in Hindu law can team up with scholars in Islamic law, so um, interdisciplinary work. Admittedly, institutional pressures in scholarly life cycle often disincentivize collaboration. So, as Mitra Sharafi has much experience in the academic community, she notes that there's more challenges of producing an interdisciplinary work, yet one gets half the credit for producing it. So, this uh, it's sort of disincentivized. If one's an author, it's like, ah, uh, do I really need to work with this person, or I can get write my own book and have all the credit to myself? So, I think that's somewhat admirable that Marcus D. Dubber and Christopher Tolman's kind of teamed up as uh, co-editors of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History. So, but nonetheless, the especially it's acute for junior scholars so trying to get the career started do they don't want to spend their whole time co-authoring things operating within the u.s style tenure system so the u.s style tenure system is very difficult to get tenure you have to produce massive amounts of papers and the uk style research assessment exercise systems and it may be in tenure system tenure makes most sense for mid-level or senior scholars so sometimes maybe the tenure system might actually help those if, if they can produce more works by co-authoring perhaps then they might actually flourish under the tenure system but maybe less so under the UK style research assessment exercise such scholars because they can't perhaps both go to their assessments or be able to fully cover the basis of their partner 
such scholars should lead in modeling this type of research. So she suggests that senior scholars should focus, should lead the charge then. And still seems potentially enormous and refreshing. And I think it's refreshing too. So I think that's a nice word to put in there because yeah, it's refreshing to have co-authorship. And so moving to section three, the conclusion. So in late 20th century, collaboration was the topic of heated debate among scholars of colonial India. By subaltern studies accounts, the Cambridge School of Indian History attributed responsibility for colonial rule to Indian traders and others who cooperated with the British. So kind of Cambridge putting it off onto other people, but nonetheless, there were other actors. Colonialism wasn't just through the government, there was also the private sector as well. This time, um, cooperation can be used positively, however, and to implement more tools, archives, and periods, and oral history. So collaboration to it with a positive extent. And should also continue to turn outward and connect uh, with other fields, for example, connecting with the South Asian legal history to make truly South Asian and not just South Asian, not just a euphemism for India. So often when people say South Asia, they're referring to India, but when they say South Asia to include the other countries, um, the influence and interactions between India and Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Nepal, Tibet, the Maldives, and Bhutan. And comparative historical research could also contribute to colonial communities debate by exploring the ways a shared colonial past continues to reveal itself or not across jurisdictions. So I might make the caveat that although there's much work that must be done in Indian legal history, there's even more in some of those previously mentioned smaller countries, which are not, not small, but small compared to India. Scholars should also continue to reach into the history of the larger Indian Ocean region and British Empire. The British Indian legal culture spread across East Af Africa and Southeast Asia, particularly through legislation and personnel. One of the um, suggestions in uh, Chinese legal history chapter was to study um, comparatively African and China because there's a lot of Chinese investment now in Africa, but to compare also, for example, India and places in Africa might also see parallels across the British Empire. Co-authorship between specialists of these different regions could help capture the richness of these legal zones. So sort of the way that I learned through this chapter, many, uh, I think, since the time of Plutarch have appreciated is that through comparison, you can fundamentally learn something about the distinct parts that you wouldn't otherwise have found. One plus one equals 2.2, for example. Finally, Indian legal history should also contribute to the conversations about legal history in the broader Anglophone world. Almost a fifth of the world's population and a nation that presents itself as the world's largest democracy, India is English speaking and common law at its upper institutional levels. So it's a complete neglect to look at the, uh, uh, it would be complete neglect to not place focus. In fact, if out of all legal history, perhaps if one fifth of the population is located there, one fifth of the, uh, the resources perhaps should go there or come from there. Yet it is typically absent from comparative Anglophone historical assessments. So consider there are more people in India than the United States, so it's strange that there is more um, English research coming out of the United States, even though not everyone in India speaks English, most of there's, I would estimate there's at least, at least 300 million who speak English, oh, probably more, I would say, yeah, probably, there are probably more English speakers in India than the United States would be my estimate, but you can, I'll look that up later, but you can tell me if I'm incorrect on that. Finally, Indian legal history should contribute to the conversations about legal history in the broad. Oh, pardon me, pardon me with that. Um, yet, to, uh, res uh, yet it is typically absent from comparative Anglophone historical assessments. A special interest here are Indus India's constitutionally mandated affirmative action systems of quotas and reservations for disadvantaged populations. So we do see an affirmative action at some of the United States top universities, so these could be seen or studied in parallel or um, in contrast to those in India. 
and constitutionalism as well could be studied because you know India does have a constitution and the United States has a constitution the United Kingdom does not have a constitution and the laws treatment of in indigenous peoples could be seen in comparison with the United States but also as we saw with, in Latin America as well and Canada as well in Australia as we've seen in previous and Australia and New Zealand in a previous chapter on Australian and New Zealand indigenous legal history so therefore the future of Indian legal history looks bright according to the author, particularly if scholars are willing to experiment and retool by working together, turning outwards, and acquiring the skill to engage with new media and techniques. Scholars can continue to imagine and reinvigorate the field of Indian legal history. So I thought very fascinating and exciting chapter by Mitra Sharafi, and I think it, um, I could feel uh, her passion and like uh, made me excited about the area too, and it's very, um, I very encourage anyone watching this to at least spend some time looking into Indian legal history, if not just this video or lecture, or if you buy the ch textbook, her chapter. So to discuss the content of the slide, and then we'll move into to a comparison between Thomas Du and Mitra Sharafi. So as for Dr. Mitra Sharafi, her position is the Uv Jue Bascon Professor of Law at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Madison Law School. Her suggested readings include Law and Identity in Colonial South Asia, Parsi Legal Culture, 1772 to 1947, published by the Cambridge University Press in 2014. Colonial Paris and Law, A Cultural History, Government Fellowship Lectures, 2009 to 2010, by the K.R. Kalma Oriental Institute in 2010. And Abortion in South Asia, 1860 to 1947, A Medico Legal History, Modern Asia St Asian Studies, 55 2, published in 2021. Dr. Mitra Sharafi's research interests include South Asian legal history, history of criminal law and forensic science, history of legal education and the legal profession, colonialism and empire, history and contract law, law and society, law and religion law and minorities, legal consciousness, legal pluralism, history of books, history of science, and medicine. As for the logos in the bottom right, we have McGill University in Canada, where she received her Bachelor of Arts in 1996, which is the year I was born, actually. The her, uh, bottom left, we have the University of Cambridge, where she received her Bachelor of Arts in Law in 1998. In the top right, we have University of Oxford, where she received her Bachelor of Civil Law, which is equivalent of um, LLM, Master of Law, for those from a common law background. I estimate she also could have done the Master of Jurisprudence, because she also does have a civil law degree. Oh no, she does not have a civil law degree. Her, she has a Bachelor of Civil Law from Oxford, but she did not do the Juris Doctor Bachelor of Civil Law at McGill. She, at McGill, she studied in history. Part of me, and but part of me, her Bachelor of Civil Law is from Oxford University in 1999. In the top center, we have Princeton University, where she received her PhD in history in 2006. And in the top left, we have the symbol of or the logo of the University of Wisconsin Madison, where she is a professor at uh, law at the School of Law. As per the three quotes, first quote we have within the field of Indian legal history, the colonial period dominates. The focus has been on British India from the late 18th century until independence in 1947 and on the history of religion and gender in India's various per personal law systems. Next quote, quote two of three, as almost a fifth of the world's population and a nation that presents itself as the world's largest democracy, India is English speaking and common law at its upper echelon levels, institutional levels, pardon me yet it is typically absent from comparative Anglophone historical assessments. Third and last quote, the future of Indian legal history looks bright, particularly if scholars are willing to experiment and retool. By working together, turning outwards, and acquiring skills to engage with new media and techniques, scholars can continue to reimagine and reinvigorate the field of Indian legal history. So very exciting motivating last quote as well. So once again, her chapter is in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, edited by Marcus D. Dover and Christopher Tomlins. It is in part four, Traditions Tracing Legal History, and it is chapter 44, Indian Law, and her name is Mitra Sharapi. So in the style of Plutarch's Lives, a brief comparison of 
uh, Thomas Juve and Mitra Sharafi. Uh, something I, I do caveat sometimes is that Plutarch's Lives, the comparisons are a fraction of the length of the actual biographies, but he really just goes straight to the point and does not go on tangents where not necessary, but I cannot promise I will not go on tangents, so but nonetheless. So uh, in terms of their education, um, Thomas Dew studied law and philosophy at Heidelberg University, at the Pontifical Catholic University of Argentina, the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, and the Munich School of Philosophy. Mitchell Serafi studied history and law at McGill, Cambridge, Oxford, and Princeton, um, and currently works at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So none of their universities overlap, and none of them overlap in terms of country either, and as of Brexit, never in continent either. So very different in terms of, of geography. But nonetheless, neither of their biographies that I could find, they have spent significant time in practice. So most of them are um, predominantly academics. Um, they both do have PhDs and they both have studied law. So not all the authors or not all legal scholars have um, PhDs and not all legal historians have uh, legal degrees as well. Um, but they are both also professors of law at Goethe University Frankfurt and University of Madison, Wisconsin, or University of Wisconsin, Madison, pardon me. But um, in addition, Thomas Duve is a director of the Max Planck Institute for Legal History and Legal Theory, the Max Planck Society, and has a, perhaps a, a few more affiliations, but it must be noted that Thomas Duve is older than Mitra Sharafi. So in terms of the geographies, Thomas Duve uh, spent most of his life in Germany, but he also has a really strong connection to Argentina, having studied there. Um, it's pretty fascinating to see someone who sort of, you know, just picks a country and really gets into it. And that hence, even coming from Germany, he is completely um, capable and you know, an excellent one to write the chapter on Latin America, despite not being born there. Mitra Sharafi um, has studied in Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States, so um, uh, three very different regions, um, two continents at least, but all predominantly Anglophone speaking, but it must be noted that McGill is located in Montreal, so perhaps, and likely she speaks French as well, and perhaps maybe she speaks Indian, but I don't know that. Or, pardon me, not Indian, there's many languages in India, there's Hindi, Bengali, more common in Bangladesh, but nevertheless, uh, I'm trying to learn a little bit of Sanskrit, but uh, Sanskrit's not really spoken anymore uh, very much. But nonetheless, um, I would say they're both most likely bilingual, at least. So, both uh, some similarities, not too much pra um, practice, um, uh, practice as lawyers, but significant time in legal academia. They're both fascinated in legal history, which separates them apart from most other legal scholars or scholars generally. They're both in the section of tracing legal history, so they both traced history in two geographies. The, um, the, uh, on the one hand, Thomas Duke does not have, a, um, uh, they, they do not have huge connections to their respective geographies. Um, Thomas Duve, he spent significant time at the uh, Pontifical University in Argentina and even uh, spent some time working in Argentina, but um, uh, but he's uh, but he's originally from Germany. As for Mitra Sharafi, she spent most of her academic, academic career outside of India. Perhaps she spent significant time there, but I, I could not, I uh, did not note that. So both of them, it's kind of interesting that they're outsiders, and I don't think um, not complete outsiders, but I think it's important that often outsiders do give a broader, sort of a broader view, and sometimes even a more meritorious view. Um, Thomas Duve is slightly more interested in European legal history. Mitra Sharafi is slightly more interested in South Asian legal history. Thomas Duve is also interested in Latin American legal history, canon and ecclesiastic law and the Salamanca School, whereas Mitra Sharafi is more interested in history of criminal law, criminal law and forensic science, law and family, law and social society slash minorities, colonialism and empire, and the history of contract law. But colonialism and empire, I would say, line up also with Latin American legal history. So more similar, so therefore they also both have interest in law and religion, also legal history. They also have interest in comparative law, and hence they've also studied comparative regions as well. And they've also won many, many awards in societies and have incredible academic backgrounds, and they're both very, very multinational, very much um, global individuals. So thank you so much to uh, Thomas Duve and Mitchell Sharafi for producing these great chapters. 
on um, uh, in, uh, Latin American legal history and Indian legal history. And thank you to Marcus D. Dubber and Christopher Tomlins for culminating all these chapters in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History. And thank you so much to you for watching and or listening to this video on Guide to Legal History and Historians. And I hope you continue to support. Thank you so much.